Thank you. First of all, a very good evening and a warm welcome to all of you. I know we've all had a very long day, a long but fruitful day filled with lots of engaging discussions. And I want to thank you in advance for actually staying awake during my talk. Um, actually, to make sure you are going to stay awake during my talk, can I ask everyone to stand up for just one second? Stand up, please, and look to your right, and just shake the hands of the person next to you and say, introduce yourself, actually say your name. I bet most of you hadn't even met each other or spoken to each other today. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. All right. So let's see if I can keep you awake for the next 17 minutes or so. I want to start by acknowledging the World Portuguese Network, the Portuguese Diaspora Council, the government of Portugal, and the many partners and sponsors that made this gathering possible. It is truly a great honor to be here, and I thank you for inviting me to be a part of this really important discourse on Europe-Africa partnership. Based on the thought-provoking panels and discussions we had today, I have no doubt this is just the first of many forums to come. You know, I've been given many illustrious titles. I've been called a social entrepreneur, a clean water advocate, philanthropist, young global leader, influencer, future president of Liberia, you name it. And while these are all acclaimed titles, which I humbly and graciously accept, I stand before you today not as an advocate or a thought leader, or a clean water expert. But as an African, as a young African woman who's passionate about her continent and the tremendous potential it holds. As a young African woman, optimistic about the future of Africa and its ability to create a just and equitable future for its people. I stand here today as a young African woman with a deep commitment to creating a sustainable Africa in which everyone has access to opportunity and basic human needs. It is this very commitment that compelled me to return home to Liberia after almost 20 years when a de deadly civil war forced my family to flee. The conflict, many of you may have heard of it, claimed over 250,000 lives and displaced millions from their homes. It destroyed the country's infrastructure, roads, healthcare facilities, factories, schools, and tore apart the very fabric of society. Face Africa was born from the ashes of this conflict when I decided, along with many others, to begin the difficult process of rebuilding our society one piece at a time. It started as fund a child's education it started with the idea that every child deserved the right to basic quality education. But that idea quickly evolved when I realized that one of the major barriers to education was the lack of access to safe drinking water and sanitation facilities in many schools and communities. Children were not showing up to schools because they were getting sick from waterborne illnesses like typhoid, diarrhea, cholera, Women and girls were spending hours walking to fetch water, hampering their productivity. And it soon became clear to me that access to safe water and sanitation was critical to achieving many of the sustainable development goals that we speak about today, whether it's goal three, good health and well-being, goal five, gender equality, or goal 13, climate change. It became clear to me that water was a catalyst for change and that affordable access to water and sanitation could transform lives and create stronger, healthier communities. And so I continued my journey as a clean water advocate based on this notion that no one anywhere should be without basic access to safe water. That idea, 10 years later, as you saw from the video, 
has impacted over 150,000 people in Liberia and Nigeria today. But more importantly, what it has done is it has shown that Africans can lead their own development efforts with young Africans like myself at the helm. It has shown that social interventions created and led by Africans are driving locally grown solutions and development on the continent. A trend that's often overlooked in the narrative on Africa and the conversations that we have about aid and philanthropic giving. And it is this narrative that needs to change if we're to have any meaningful dialogue about trust and partnership and collaboration. Kola Karim spoke earlier today about perception. And unfortunately, the perceptions about Africa has been and continues to be rife with misconceptions that have become part of a divisive, misleading, and harmful narrative on the continent. We live in a world today where the global landscape is rapidly changing. Today, more than ever, we're faced with extreme environmental, political, economic, and social challenges. And these are not just African issues. These are Asian issues. These are American problems. These are European problems. These are complex global issues that require us to aggressively forge and leverage partnerships and collaborations in order to deliver on the promise of a sustainable future for all. And for us to forge these partnerships, we need trust, which is one of, if not the most critical feature of any successful and sustained collaborative partnership. But how do we begin to build trust between two continents that wish to call themselves allies when the genesis of their bond is so deeply tied to colonialism? How do we build trust when our ability to work together is hindered by a history of suppression, humiliation, and exploitation that has caused and continues to cause many conflicts and instability in Africa today? How does one party view the other as a valuable and equal participant in the world and not, and not as the younger sibling it has to raise? How does one party trust that the other has their best interest at heart and are not just engaging because, the, because of the jewels they have in their hands? Can we in fact establish a partnership based on mutual respect, as we've heard today, and void of suspicion and condescension? Because let's not pretend that these challenges don't pose a, a lopsided dynamic between Africa and Europe. I mean, even today, the wealth of industrialized countries is in part based on the unchecked exploitation of the people and resources of the African continent. Building trust requires us to learn from this history and assume responsibility for a way forward. And building trust means acknowledging this checkered past while committing ourselves to deliver on the collective ambition and on the potential of our two continents. We've talked a lot about opportunities throughout the day. So let's look at some of those opportunities. The size of Africa alone, three times the size of Europe, 54 countries, home to 3,000 ethnic groups and communities, 300 languages. Africa is the cradle of humankind. Africa is in all of us. The continent is abundantly rich, home to 15% of global oil reserves, 40% of gold reserves, 80% of platinum metal reserves, and has the largest expanse of agricultural land in the world. In addition to this rich richness in resources, it boasts cultural diversity, entrepreneurial spirit, innovative power, and great untapped potential in the areas of renewables and agriculture. The Africa of today is rising. No doubt. In the last few decades, there have been many positive developments on the continent that we can point to. The GDP, for example, has increased fivefold since 1990. Child and maternal mortality has been reduced by half. And 80% of all children attend primary school today. Whether they're getting quality education, that's a different story. But the, despite the tremendous riches and progress, there's still challenges. We heard many of them today. 
in many African countries, corrupt elite still have too much influence, preferring to channel their money abroad instead of investing it locally. Elites who decide to sell their arable land and fisheries instead of using them to feed their own population, who let multinationals exploit the country's natural resources without creating domestic value chains. Large sections of the African population are suffering from a culture, a political culture that doesn't define government as a duty to serve the common good, but as a right to enrich yourself. And the women of Africa, who quite frankly hold the key to the continent's future, but are often excluded from being active and productive members of society. International corporations are also falling very short in some areas, namely with regard to meeting local environmental standards and compliance regulations. I see this play out in my own country all the time, where mining and rubber companies avoid paying their fair share of taxes. According to the AFDB, the continent has lost more than $1 trillion in the last 50 years, money that could have been used for sustainable development. Illicit financial flows currently amounts to $50 billion every single year. Imagine if that were being reinvested back into African economies. Agriculture. Our colleague earlier spoke about agriculture and the huge potential that it offers. Africa can feed itself, but instead, it spends 35 billion on food imports every single year. The eggs that we eat in Liberia comes from Ukraine and India. The tomatoes come from Guinea, and our pepper comes from halfway across the world. That's unacceptable. More than 230 million people on the continent are still suffering from hunger. The main cause of hunger is poverty. Poverty is a predominantly rural phenomenon. So why do we continue to neglect investments in agriculture, a sector that could create massive number of jobs and solve the hunger crisis on the continent? But despite these challenges, Africa is a con continent of tremendous opportunity, dynamic development, and our greatest asset, of course, is our youth. Half of the African population of 1.2 billion is under the age of 25. And by 2050, that number is set to double. Of course, this population growth presents challenges, economic challenges, social challenges, but also an opportunity. The dynamic power of a young society should be the main driver of economic development. For this to happen, we need to invest in Africa's young people, provide access to education and training. By 2035, Africa will have the largest potential workforce in the world. The continent needs some 20 million new jobs every year. It's critical that we use this asset to generate a demographic dividend both in Africa and Europe. Migration. We talked about migration earlier on a panel today, and it's been a topic throughout the day. Migration from Africa is predominantly mot motivated by economic factors. All across the continent, low productivity, unemployment, poor economic conditions, lack of opportunities for advancement, especially among young people, is the main push factor behind migration to Europe. Ultimately, Africans share the same ambitions as everyone else around the world, to improve their own lives, but they want to do so at home. As Manuel Mota mentioned earlier, home is home. No one wants to leave home. We all want to stay home. So what, what can we do? What plan of action can we take to change the conditions that push people to move? And what is the way forward? What are my hopes for Africa and Europe? Today, more than ever, the two continents need each other. Africa needs Europe as much as Europe needs Africa. But it can't be business as usual. We need to do a lot of things differently, a lot of things. We need a paradigm shift in the way that Europe engages with Africa. 
starting with the sh a shift in development policies and practices towards Africa. Development in general needs to be re-examined and we need to introduce new channels for efficient, transparent, and value-adding assistance. Aid packages need to shift towards projects that encourages and promote economic growth and employment opportunities to help create an environment that will in turn positively reduce migration. It all ties in together. Europe and member states must engage with Africa as an equal. That means reaching new agreements on political, economic, social, and cultural cooperation. We must move away from this concept of donor and recipient countries and focus on joint economic cooperation instead. But I go back once again to Africa's greatest asset, its young people. Whatever cooperation we develop, whatever bridges we build, whatever commitments we make here today, we must include prioritizing education, training, and employment to create opportunities for young people, build entrepreneurial skills, and harness the potential of Africa's youth. Just like me, there are thousands of young Africans tackling the challenges that our continent faces. But we don't just look at them as challenges. We don't just see them as burdens. We see them as opportunities. Yes, there might be some young people trapped in the deserts of Libya looking for greener pastures, but there's also Patrick Ngoi, who saw the opportunity in solar energy in Kenya and is now a millionaire. Entrepreneurs like Sangu Dile of Ghana, whose company is focused on building, on building Africa's healthcare future. Peter Malcolm King of Liberia, whose company has a number of mid-sized infrastructure projects and is looking to expand in the region. Tara Duratoye, who took the art of beauty to build 27 stores across Nigeria and has footprints in five different countries. These are young, brilliant minds, a generation of committed young leaders who are actively contributing to the development of Africa in many different ways. I smile when I think about Yoba, the Silicon Valley of Lagos, and all the other brilliant, innovative ideas that are seeking and craving for partnerships and investments in Kenya, in Ghana, and beyond. When I think of Andela, the Lagos-based company that trains and employs software developers, which recently closed on a $24 million investment from Mark Zuckerberg. President Macron was in Nigeria recently and said himself that Africa cannot function without, that Europe cannot function without Africa. So in closing, because my time is up, um, I think it's time we change how we engage the continent. It's time we engage the continent for the true value that it presents. It's time we collaborate and not just dominate. It's time we enable and empower and not just think about our pockets. As the world gets more and more sophisticated and Africa continues to rise and to build its own technology base, as the new crop of young African leaders begin to rise and get into positions of power, envisioning new modern directions for our countries, we want to know that we have partners in you. We want to know that we have friends who want to gain as well as build. I started an organization to, to provide clean water to communities across Africa. But my vision isn't just to provide water to Africa. My vision is to build an Africa that provides water for itself, and not just itself, but for the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you.